It's the fall of 2002. Over on Raw, Triple H's reign of terror with the World Championship is just in its infancy. Over on the blue brand, the SmackDown 6 is chugging along. Meanwhile, the Attitude Era continues to go down, kicking and screaming. This week, we look at WWE No Mercy 2002 from October 20th at the Altel Arena in North Little Rock, Arkansas. This show was nominated by Dylan Haggett, Joshua Vincent, Tim Whalen, Jay Chipshow, and Skylar Grennert over at patreon.com slash wrestling with regret. It is kind of fun in hindsight looking back at this period of the ruthless aggression era. It's very early stages as it is making that transition. But yeah, there is a clear number one show between the two of these and it's not raw. You know, SmackDown at this point is gaining the reputation of becoming the A show across the two brands because of Paul Heyman's booking, because of the use of the SmackDown 6, who we'll get into more when those matches come up. Meanwhile on Raw, yeah, things aren't that exciting at this point because Triple H is starting to take over as the newly crowned first ever World Heavyweight Champion. He just beat RVD to retain it Unforgiven, beginning his alliance with Ric Flair. And of course, we are hurtling toward the end of one of the most prestigious championships in company history as the Intercontinental Championship is about to be retired. But hey, Raw wasn't totally bad during this time because hey, you know, around this time, there was that episode with the first ever Raw Roulette. That was really entertaining. You know, Goldust and Regal and everything that came with that. And um, what else? Uh, Christopher Nowinski. That was a fun gimmick. But not to say SmackDown was without fault. And we will certainly get to that as this review goes along. But let's see how this show begins. It actually opens up with a cold open with The Undertaker sitting in the locker room. Kane sitting down next to him. And Kane goes, so... How was your week? Ha ha ha, get it? Because both of them dealt with terrible booking this last week. Very dramatic opening hype package to start things off, showing the two biggest storylines in the company right now. And then the very end of the package, it's this cacophony of all these sounds that's hitting you over the head at the same time. Let's have bells ringing and let's have babies crying and a Jewish man screaming in Latin. <laughs> Ten thousand in the arena in Arkansas. Not quite a sellout, but the show did earn three hundred thousand pay-per-view buys. Michael Cole and Taz are on the call for SmackDown, and Jim Ross and the King for Raw, and they're going to open this show up for the World Tag Team Title match as Chris Jericho and Christian defend against Booker T and Goldust. Jericho and Booker T have been at each other's throats for weeks now. Jericho costing Booker matches against the Big Show on Raw mostly. The CNC Wrestling Factory beat Kane and Hurricane last week to become the new tag team champions and Jericho does not like being called a sucker. That is one of the biggest reasons I think that Jericho and Booker are fighting at this point. Also, one thing Jericho is doing at this point in his career, one of the many things he would kind of pick up and leave behind if it didn't work, was his introducing himself to women doing the Joey thing from Friends. <laughs> Match begins, Goldust hits a pair of hip attacks, or gold butt as the commentary calls it. The heels soon take over, Goldust taking the heat for a good old time here, finally tagging in Booker T, who is a house of fire at first, but gets hung up on the top rope. Mid kick gets beat up a bit, shattered dreams and some head on head action in the corner. That leads to a near fall, Booker is back on top for a while, hits the spinner Rooney, Jericho going for a triangle drop kick, but the rope breaks, that's really scary. Chaos on the outside, Jericho bolts. Bulldogs gold dust onto the title belt. Audible with the top rope moonsault, the cover, and the champs retain. Three stars out of five for me on this one. I will say they did a great job recovering from that broken rope, and that's a scary thing to happen in the very first match. What a bad omen it would seem to have that happen. But like I said, they recovered really well. I think Jericho and Christian, they're really early in their team their team ship here because the Un-Americans just broke up, and Christian was a part of that. But I like the chemistry that Jericho and Christian have as a team here. I think they're a really underrated baddie tag team on Raw during this time. And I think he... Those two and Booker T and Goldust, who are perennial baby faces, such a fun team to follow if you watch their progression in 02. Uh, really fun. And they're going to get their due later on this year, but not quite yet for them. Backstage, we go to Funaki, SmackDown's number one announcer, and his special guest, Al Wilson, father of Tori. Listen as Funaki breaks down the entire Al Wilson, Don Marie storyline, and
And every time Funaki asks Al a question, he just goes, mm, uh, bleh. And they finally show the shower scene on SmackDown, the go-home show, where he's fully clothed for whatever reason. Funaki asks him, why were you showering with your clothes on? Very valid question. And Al's only spoken word in this bit is him going, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Boo! Boo! That was a shitty payoff to that skit, man. I was with you. All the way, I actually loved the absurdity of Funaki trying to ask questions of Al Wilson and he just can't get the words out. And then like the punchline, I get it, they're in Arkansas, Bill Clinton country. And so, you know, for them to drop the Bill Clinton line, Four years after that reference, by the way. So very timely reference by WWE here. But like, I was with them. I was I was holding on to the very end because this was such a ridiculous storyline and a ridiculous scene. But then they do that. I'm like, that's your punchline? Like, oh God, this, what, what a waste of a punchline. What a wasted opportunity there. Speaking of Tori and Don Marie, we go to their one-on-one -on -one match now. Things have gotten really serious between these two because it began weeks ago when Tori beat Don Marie in a bikini contest and then a lingerie contest. Her newly divorced dad, Al Wilson, began showing up and Don Marie immediately making moves, as we saw in that recap with Funaki, on Al, and then we see what happens to the shower scene and everything. It is a very bizarre story, and you know, I've covered it in some detail in a variety of videos over the years. Go check out my uh, countdown on the worst soap opera storylines. I do a, a pretty good job kind of giving you the whole scope of the Tori Wilson, Al Wilson, Don Marie absolute cluster. Like I said, SmackDown was good this time, but they were not perfect. And I think this storyline, as batty as it is, at the time watching it, it's like, this is just cringe. Anyway, Tori starts by drop kicking Dawn off the apron before the bell. Dawn showing some agility before she drops Tori over the top rope. Dawn throwing some knees into Tori's midsection, allowing her to take over. Tori ducking a line. Things get catfighty. The referee is steamrolled. He seems to like it. Dawn is upset by that, though. She just checks Tori with a clothesline when she comes out of the corner. At one point on commentary during this match, Michael Cole telling Taz, you know, Taz, if Dawn Marie marries Al Wilson, she'd be Tori's mother. And Taz goes, oh, I wish my mom looked like that, I'm like, what? Really? Anyway, Tori makes a big comeback, hits a running swing neck breaker, and pins to win. It certainly defied my expectations as to what these two could do in the ring. It was better than I thought it was going to be. Still was not great. But honestly, you know, this storyline is not about the action in the ring. It's not about the, the wrestling. This could not be further away from being about the wrestling at all. Rob Van Dam interviewed backstage. He's asked about his opponent tonight and Ric Flair. He says Flair styles and profiles while RVD flies coach and takes rental cars. Suddenly Van Dam has what could best be described as a psychotic episode and begins to strut back and forth how he's a chair smashing, frog splashing, risk taking, yinning and yanging, not a rhyme, woo woo woo, Van Daminating. Dude, holy shit, these promos are off the rails tonight. After he leaves though, coach sees Brock Lesnar, Paul Heyman, and Tracy the Mistress, who reiterates that The Undertaker is a lying, cheating scumbag and hopes to see Lesnar beat him to a pulp. More on all that later. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the previous month's show was Unforgiven, and one of the big story points in that show was Ric Flair turning on Rob Van Dam and costing him the world title match against Triple H. That's what began that very successful pairing between Triple H and Flair. Of course, that leads to evolution and all that, but Flair continues to be a thorn born in RVD's side in the weeks between Unforgiven and this show, which is why we have this grudge match here. This has to be one of the last times, by the way, we see Flair wrestle with dry hair. Van Dam off to a fast start, doing his spinning leg drop off the apron and onto Flair. The match finally officially begins once both guys are in the ring, though. Flair bumping his ass off for Van Dam early on, but takes him to Dick Kick City, following up with a chalk block. Continues working on his opponent's leg. Meanwhile, Lawler doing a bit of a sidebar on commentary, talking about the story with The Undertaker. And he says that he can understand and, and sympathize with The Undertaker cheating on his pregnant wife. Haha, <laughs> gross! Flair puts Rob in the figure four, but Rob rolls over to the ropes. They go for it again, but Flair almost caught with a roll up. More classic Flair. He's thrown off the top rope. RVD follows up with Rolling Thunder, but a rope break on the cover. Van Dam hits the five star frog splash on Flair. The cover and the win, even though Flair's shoulder is technically up by the end of the count. 
I give this one two and a half stars out of five. The match to me was just okay. It was like best of Van Damme, best of Flair. They gave you all of their, their primary spots that they're known and loved for, and they certainly did those well. And besides that, it, to me, it was just kind of a match. Like, it was there. Flair is kind of in that lackey position now, he, you know, the assistant to Triple H, so it doesn't really hurt anything in the grand scheme of things that he takes a loss there. But it is good rebuilding for Van Damme. Backstage, the big show chatting with SmackDown GM Stephanie McMahon. He says he wants some advice, but she says she's not the one to talk to. In comes Raw GM Eric Bischoff, who's mad that show is talking with the enemy, so to speak. Now show gets to air his grievances to him. Hasn't been on a pay-per-view since July. Talks about how he's a Don't giant with all these giant. different accomplishments. Bischoff asks him who the hell does he think he is. Show getting physical and warns him that he's a very angry giant and not to cross him. By the end of the month, the big show show will be traded over to SmackDown, which kind of flies in the face of the brand split and the rules that they had had is set in place about these ironclad contracts. There was supposed to be a freeze, but nope, still trades, I guess. Here's the very nice Intercontinental title legacy package they ran the previous week on Raw. Hey, remember all these cool moments surrounding the championship? Isn't it awesome we're putting a stop to that shit for no reason? Up next for the Cruiserweight Championship, Jamie Noble Boy defends against Ty Jiri. It's the third match in a row where they go, we're going to start fighting before the bell rings. There must have been some directive from above to add like a sense of urgency to these mid-card matches, which is why you've got three of them in a row doing the same basic opening. But yeah, to have that re repetition is not great. Noble with a running electric chair drop. Never seen that before. Lots of fast action as the match goes on. Noble wears Tajiri down. The buzzsaw comes back though. Great tornado DDT. Nice bow and arrow across the back into a spin. They don't even know what to call it. Followed up with a tarantula in the ropes. Tajiri's got the match won until Nidia gets on the apron and plants a smooch on referee Brian Hebner. Noble comes back, hits the tiger bomb. We get a kick out. Tajiri goes for a victory roll, but Nidia trips up Tajiri allowing Noble to block and cover to win and retain. After the bell, Tajiri responds with a revenge smooch, which Nidia seems to like. Noble's like, let me teach you how to kiss a woman! He goes for it, and then Tajiri kicks him in the back of the head, knocking them both out. True love. Three out of five stars for me on this one. This is an entertaining matchup here. I like the fast pace of it. I think Tajiri and Noble have good chemistry together, and it's always fun watching a Tajiri match, as well as a Jamie Noble match at this time. You know, I used the word underrated earlier in this review, but I think it also applies to Noble because, you know, you see the, the pay-per-view matches he has when he is the champion or challenger for the championship. Some of those matches are the best you see on SmackDown any given week. Backstage, Chris Benoit is looking for Eddie Guerrero, and he warns Eddie that Chavo's getting beaten up by Kurt Angle down the hall, needs to help him. Eddie is too smart for this, though, realizes what he and Chavo did to Benoit a couple weeks before, realizing this is just a trap. That's not Chavo here is getting beaten up in there. It's some little girl, but uh-oh, Chavo actually was beaten up by Angle. Waka waka! Up next, the 26-year history of the Intercontinental Championship goes up in a cloud of smoke in a match fourth from the top. It's winner take all as both belts are on the line here. IC Champion Kane takes on World Champion Triple H. This is the result of Eric Bischoff recently announcing he's retiring the Intercontinental Championship, merging it with the world title at No Mercy. And that, you know, it, <laughs> it frustrates me to think about it now, 21 years after the fact, and it pissed me off as a kid back then too. I had no understanding, I, and, and they've never really had a good explanation ever since then as to why we're getting rid of this championship. Now, obviously, like earlier in the year, there was the European title, there was the hardcore title, those both got absorbed and like into the IC title as well when Rob Van Dam was a champion. And so now, well, why would you want to have fewer titles, so few titles, in fact, on a dual brand show? Unless your name is Triple H, there is no one out there who I think is really advocating to absorb the championship and add it on to the world title in this one. I just think that was a real boneheaded move because you've got all these guys with nothing to fight for now that there's no mid-card belts and not everyone can be a tag team or fight Triple H. So it was, to me, a very 
flawed uh, exercise, and that's why it didn't last all that long. They did bring it back the following year, but still, the fact that this was even happening at all uh, really upset me as a fan. But during all this, Kane is on a big red roll. He found a tag partner in the Hurricane to beat the Un-Americans for the World Tag Titles, won the Intercontinental Championship, beating Chris Jericho a few weeks ago, and gosh, for the first time in his life, Kane is happy. But how happy is Katie Vick, Triple H asks. So that's where this whole thing begins. The Katie Vick storyline, it is obviously something that has been covered a whole lot here on this channel, since the very beginning almost. And in many ways, I've retired discussion about it, but since we're covering this show, we gotta talk about it a little bit. So yes, Triple H accuses Kane of being a murderer because of this woman named Katie Vick. And the following week, Kane goes on Raw to explain his side of the story. And he opens up his speech by saying, Katie Vick was a friend of mine. And he goes on to this whole story about how 10 years ago, when he had just started to wrestle, like Katie was someone who attended his first match he ever had, and she was such a good friend, and they went to a party together, and uh, Katie had too much to drink, so Kane's gonna drive her home, but there's an animal on the road, a very nondescript animal. Don't even say what the animal is. An animal is on the road. The road is slick, and Kane swerves out of the way because he can't drive stick, and they fall off a cliff or whatever the fuck happens, and so Kane's hurt, but Katie dies instantly. And so Kane tells a story, says it was an accident. He's very sorry about it. He thinks about it every day. So first of all, that promo completely retcons Kane's entire backstory that we have been led to believe was the case from like 1997 up until now. Had the promo storytelling ended here at this point, then, you know, could have been fine. Not great, could have been fine, but no. Triple H has to come out and do his rebuttal and he is all like, whoa, whoa, the police report also says you were drunk and also your semen was totally in her body. Did you have your way with her before she died or after? Uh? And after this, JR keeps going, oh, it's all mind games and stuff. But like, is it though? Because Kane never refutes the Katie Vick story in the first place. He never calls Triple H a liar or that, oh, you're full of shit because that wasn't the, the police report. No, by Triple H dropping that turn in the punch bowl, and not being responded to in any way, that immediately made Kane way less sympathetic of a figure. It's one thing to say, oh, Kane, you're a murderer because your passenger died in a car crash, and you could have some kind of like, you know, uh, plausible separation from that, and maybe say he's not a murderer. Two, oh, he was a drunk driver, and he may have had sex with her before or after she died. Yay, you go beat Triple H and win both those belts, you hero, you. Why is this the storyline for this massive title unification. The match begins, what is wrong with you? Kane screams at H to a minimal pop. Kane throwing his weight around with Triple H, but Hunter comes back after Kane goes head first into the corner, hits a big spine buster, and on commentary at this point, JR says, oh, if Kane wins, he'll be the first masked wrestler to be a recognized world champion. And Jerry Lawler says, would he be the first murderer too? And like, you know, we would get one of those in a few years, but not him. Triple H gets on Kane's shoulders with the sleeper, but Kane fights back. JR with a call tonight. Between Katie Vick and Seaman, I'm having a hard time concentrating on this match. Kane goes flying, but in comes Ric Flair, who drops Kane over the top rope. Big Red Machine's undeterred, knocks H and Flair down. Triple H with a belt shot, but Kane kicks out. Here comes the Hurricane to chase Flair away. Triple H hits Hurricane with a pedigree on the floor, so he's a non factor for the rest of this thing. Goes for a flying nothing, but takes a boot. The referee is knocked out. H goes for another flying nothing, but takes a choke slam through the announce table instead. The referee is still down. In comes Nate with the sledgy. Kane stops him in his tracks, stands over Triple H with the sledgehammer for ages until finally the champion takes him to Dick Kick City. He grabs the sledgy. He's picked up for a tombstone. Triple H hits him with the hammer. Kane still is able to hit a big choke slam. Another referee comes in. Flair yoinks him out of the ring. Flair goes off top. He goes for a flying nothing, but walks right into a choke slam. Pedigree by Triple H, the cover, the win. I gave it two and a half stars out of five, and that right there, at the time at least, was the end of the lineage and the history of the Intercontinental Championship. Can you imagine if 21 years later they never brought that belt back and that was the last like image we saw of that belt? That would have been a whole other crime in and of itself. But man, they sure made Kane look like a chump in record time. Like they went from him giving this huge super push looking really strong. Then this storyline comes up and Kane is completely left just like without any kind of assistance, 
no way to come back from that. And so by losing to Triple H, then yeah, then Triple H is right in, in by, by all logic. Oh, not only are you a loser, you also are a murderer. So yeah, why should we care about you? But I just don't understand why is this match so low on the card? How is the women's championship match built higher for the Raw side of things on this show than the world championship and the intercontinental championship? Can you tell I'm still harboring some bad feelings about this time? One day later. Backstage, Stephanie McMahon has a word with Mistress Tracy. Steph having a woman to woman talk, trying to sympathize with her and get some information out of her here. Tracy admits the relationship with Mark was all a lie. It was all seven years ago. Not recently, like she said, but Paul Heyman made her lie about it. She wants Mark back and doesn't care about no pregnant wife, but uh oh, in walks Taker, who heard the whole thing. Back to the casting agency for you, Tracy. When the brand split first began, the tag team titles had a permanent home on Raw and became the World Tag Team Championships. So SmackDown made their own set of tag belts, the WWE Tag Team Championships. It, it, we, look, if you go on Wikipedia and try and find the lineage of like, any of the tag belts here, it's a very confusing lineage in this company. But anyway, these new belts are being debuted as part of this tournament. We're going to see the first few rounds on television, and we are going to get that matchup as Edge and Rey Mysterio take on Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit in the finals. This is going to be a great matchup here. Kurt and Benoit still bitter rivals. They're fighting each other, but Stephanie makes them a team and tells them if they can't get along and if their acrimony results in physicality, they'll both be suspended for a year. But like I said, I'm very excited for this one. This match featuring two thirds of the SmackDown six, the Guerreros obviously making up the rest of this unit. But man, this is a great time to be a fan of SmackDown. Like I said, these guys were really killing it with matches on a weekly basis. Some combination of any of these guys usually resulted in one of the top matches of the night. Let's see how this one goes. I like Ray's frustration at the beginning, unable to get out of Kurt's waist lock, so he just steps on his foot. Good intense work between Edge and Benoit for a few minutes. Nice back and forth. Edge gets caught by Angle, then the unlikely partners wear him down for a while. Benoit goes up top, but Edge catches him, hits a superplex. Ray gets the tag, goes on a tear. Big leg drop onto Benoit, but the pin's broken up. Benoit with a great counter into the cross face, but that's broken up. Kurt with a big suplex to Ray off the top. Ray's in the ring for a while now. He manages to slip away from Benoit. We get a double hot tag to Edge and Angle. Edge launching Ray into Kurt and hits a big Hurricane Rana. Benoit goes to the headbutt, but he hits Angle by mistake. Benoit with a cross face on Edge, but Ray doing the 619, hitting Benoit. Big assisted moonsault by Ray onto Benoit outside. Kurt grabs Edge in the ankle lock, and after Edge counters into one of his own, Kurt gets the hold right back on there. Edge taps, and we have new tag team champions. I give it four and a half stars out of five. This match is just so much fun to watch. These guys do great work together. And like I said, this was the lifeblood of SmackDown at this time. Like these four guys were part of a larger entity of guys who were just making like such magic. You know, you hate to use that word flippantly, but that's kind of what it was during this time. And I think it was a big reprieve from what Raw was giving us at this time because Raw wasn't really focused on the wrestling so much as the big characters and stories, which may or may not always have panned out. And so, like I said, this match up here, easily one of the top of the night and probably one of the top of the year. In the medical room, the Undertaker with his bloody cast from last week, he tells the doctor to give him the shot. The doctor says it's unethical. Why? What are you giving him? Taker says if he doesn't get the shot, he ain't gonna make it through hell in a cell, which seems to be the story of his last several matches over the years. I watched that last ride documentary. In a match for the Women's Championship, you got Trish Stratus defending against the recently debuted Victoria. Victoria is a relative newcomer to the Raw roster. If you don't include her brief run as one of the Godfather's former hoes in the year 2000. But the story here is Victoria is, like Trish Stratus, a former fitness model. The two were colleagues together, and Victoria has it out for Trish here. This real is like blood feud, like the blood in her eyes going for Trish here. And she explains because, oh, back when they were both former fitness models, like they both were, got a look by WWE, and you know, Trish pretended to be a good friend and supportive and everything, but she actually wasn't. And now Victoria is mad about it. And so that's why we have this 
this feud here. Trish takes Victoria down with a series of kicks and knees. On the outside, Victoria dropping the champ down onto the barricade. Back in the ring, Trish managing to get off her trademark Hurricane Rana out of the corner. Victoria gets Trish up for a backbreaker for a bit. Thought it was going to be Widow's Peak for a second. Nice electric chair by Trish follows up with a chick kick and a two count. The Stratus faction is countered, but Trish rolls up Victoria to win and retain. But after the bell, Vicky lays Trish out. I give it two stars out of five. This match, you know, served the purpose of being that kind of come down match between the big tag team championship match and then the Hell in a Cell. Next up here, it certainly was not as bad as the other women's match we had on this show, so I'll give them that. But uh, yeah, besides that, you know, Victoria would get her due. She would win the women's championship at Survivor Series the next month. But besides that, yeah, this match, uh, it was fine for what it was. Rikishi is at the world in Times Square. He talks about how Hell in the Cell changed his career. He was never taken seriously again after gently falling onto a pillowy soft bed of wood shavings. When asked who he picks for the main event, he's going with the dead man because hey, BSK runs deep. Now it's time for our main event, a heck in a sec match for the WWE Championship, no longer undisputed, as Brock Lesnar defends against the dead man, The Undertaker. Now, during the summer, Lesnar became exclusive to SmackDown, no longer the undisputed championship. That's what brought about the world title in the first place on Raw. Lesnar and Taker have been feuding for a while, and after an inconclusive title match at Unforgiven, a rematch is set for no mercy, and it's going to be a Hell in a Cell match. Lesnar had never been in that kind of match before, so he's very very nervous, but we need to add some spice to this storyline. What can we do here? Well, let's see here. Over on Raw, uh, Kane is accused of being a murderer slash rapist and or necrophiliac. Oh, let's do something really similar with The Undertaker. Let's have him be accused of having an extramarital affair. So then Tracy appears and accuses him, calling him Mark, of messing around with her and she's unaware that he was a wrestler or that he was married. Uh, who do you think Sarah was? was when you saw his neck tattoo. And first he's like, I've never seen this woman before. I don't know who this person is. Sarah, you gotta believe me. I, I don't know this woman. Who is this person? And then the next week, Taker gives his side of the story. And he's like, well, actually I lied. I do know who this woman is, but from seven years ago, we have not seen each other in a long time. And that's the thing. So again, like, week one, the accusation happens. Oh no, why would they say that thing about our favorite wrestler? Week two, the babyface wrestler does something that makes them seem even worse. Like, when Taker gives his side of the story, oh, I don't know this woman. Actually, I do. One week later, I'm going to tell the truth. So, okay, you're a liar. That's fine. You maybe not be cheating with your, against your wife now, but, like, fine. You still are an unreliable narrator. And then the thing with, with Kane and Triple H coming in, making him look worse. Like, why were both Raw and SmackDown kind of looking off each other's notes when trying to write these concurrent storylines, it seemed? Like, why are they, why are Kane and The Undertaker going through this at the same time? There's no reason for this. Oh, by the way, Taker's hand is also broken after Brock smashed it with a big metal tank backstage, and despite Brock and Heyman's protests, he is allowed to wear his cast in the match, which does double as a weapon. Taker's here, and he's pumped full of drugs. Taker in control early on after he connects with his cast for the first time, but it does hurt him in the process. Brock begins attacking Taker's hand, the challenger screaming in pain, still able to hit some well-timed blows. Lesnar is bleeding now, Taker just having his way with him for a while. On the top rope as Lesnar's on the apron, Taker drops down awkwardly. Oh, sure, he got him. Great moment of Heyman desperately reaching into the cell, but he pays for it. Now even Heyman is bleeding, Taker grabbing him by the tie and pulling him repeatedly into the cell wall. Great visual there. Lesnar even collides into Heyman. Lesnar finally fights back, driving Taker repeatedly into the the cell. Now a belt has entered the equation. Taker's hand is tied up to the side of the cell as Heyman screams, you're gonna die now! Lesnar gets a chair, just pulverizes that casted hand. Looks pretty graphic that shot there. Lesnar fights for a while to rip the cast off of Taker's hand and he does. Heyman looks insane with his face covered in blood like that. Finally back in the ring, Lesnar hanging off the top truss of the cell, kicking Taker in the head, setting himself up perfectly for a low blow and gets knocked off. Taker with an elbow drop. The fighting continues on the outside again. Lesnar laying out Taker with the steel steps. Now he looks very gross with how much he's bleeding. Lesnar's 
A very bloody taker manages to fight back, throwing them suit bones. Ugh, there's blood in the camera lens, dripping off the ropes. This shit's gross. Taker steps on Lesnar's hand. We get some poetic justice there. Taker finally goes for old school for the first time all night, but Lesnar yoinks him down. Lesnar goes to the F5, countered into a choke slam and the kick out. Jesus, is a lot of blood. I don't think it got this bad again until Eddie Guerrero and JBL. Taker hits the last ride, but Brock grabs the ropes at the last second. Taker goes to the tombstone, but Lesnar reverses it and just hucks him onto his shoulders for an F5. My God, Lesnar wins and retains. Cool moment at the end where Lesnar climbs the cell and holds up the championship to close out the show. I give it four stars out of five. This was another very strong show in this card, and if it weren't for the tag title match, I would say this was the match of the night. It was so brutal. It was hard to watch at times with how much these two, well, all three guys were bleeding. How often do you see that where the manager gets color as well in a match where he's not even like physically in the ring? I thought that was really impressive. You know, if you're not going to have people go into the cell walls or flying off the top or whatever, you got to make up for it somehow and you got to do that with a whole lot of blood. And I think they did that for sure here. And yeah, just a great brutal, hard-hitting matchup. It makes Lesnar look like a million bucks able to fight back and win clean against The Undertaker like that. That was just really, in a year where he had a lot of star-making performances, this was one of them. My grade for No Mercy 2002 is a B. I think this was, you know, definitely a strong show here. The Ruthless Aggression era early on as they're still trying to figure out, you know, what everyone is and where everyone belongs. Uh, you're getting some good storylines and good matches. Maybe not all across the board, like we see here on this show tonight. There are some blind spots, there are some weak points, but I think as far as entering action goes, you're going to get a lot of good stuff during this time here. Some, yeah, overall, a really, really good series of matches. I mean, the ending of Triple H and Kane is frustrating for sure. Again, why'd you even have to retire the Intercontinental Championship? Wasn't necessary. Just adds more heat to Triple H. Obviously, I like he needed it. But I think besides that, though, I think, yeah, most of the action you're going to see in this in this show, pretty darn solid. Dead man walk. Yeah, you dig it, sucker! You're the sucker. But what did you think of No Mercy, folks? And what did you think of this review for it? Let me know in the comment section below. Be sure to give the video a thumbs up if you like it. Subscribe to Wrestling With Regret. Hit that bell icon to get all the notifications. And, of course, we are rolling through the month of October. It's still spooky season here this month. And in two weeks weeks we go back to the year 1993 oh that familiar year we've been seeing a lot so far lately we're gonna look at halloween havoc 93 i'm brian zane and i'll see you next time